Are you there? Yeah. <laughs>
what's up, guys? Um, so baptism, uh, it's the symbol that a believer follows when they have stepped into a relationship with Jesus and been changed and transformed by the love of God in their life. And as you go into the water, there's some things that are represented. One would be just the cleansing that God does in our life, that you are forgiven of all of your sins, past, present, and future. And then there's this, this renewal that you're raising up, saying that there's new life that Jesus has given me, and there's redemption, that he gives you this new purpose as you walk in that new life. And tonight we have three coming to get baptized. And first we have Erica coming to get baptized tonight. You caught it, you caught it, you caught it. <laughs> Erica, um, she, she was meeting actually with Tyler and I got to talk with her a little bit as well. Um, but, but she said that she found herself in this place of, of deep sadness and she was trying to fill the void in her heart and her life with alcohol and, and the party life and different relationship type stuff. And she, just, and she said, obviously, it doesn't work and, and Jesus does. And she's here to proclaim before all of you tonight that Christ really does bring satisfaction that the world never can as she follows him. So Erica, who do you profess as Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. It's upon that profession I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Next, we have Ashley coming to get baptized. So uh, Ashley, um, she, she actually spent uh, from some loss that she experienced in her life and abandonment things that happened in her life with her dad leaving and things like that. She, she really felt frustration and anger towards the Lord for, for years. And, and then she realized that, that as she started to come here and hear the message of what Jesus has for our lives, she, she came to me at the end of a Sunday night and, and she was talking to me about how God had really broke through all that hardness that was there and shown her that it wasn't God that did those things, but he's actually the hope that she was longing for. And through meeting with her therapist, she, she realized that she needed to say yes to Jesus, and she's done that, and she's here to follow up in believer's baptism. So Ashley, who do you profess as Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus Christ. It's upon that profession I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Praise God. And next we have Ray coming to get baptized. As we were talking, Ray said that, you know, coming into college, he chased a lot of things that a typical college student might, might dive into and found himself doing some things that he knew probably weren't the best. Uh, and, and he said that as we were talking, he talked about how God over these last months has been shifting him and changing his heart. And, and he said I, this statement, he said, I, I've, I've had the happiness of the highs of this world and the party life and all that comes with that. And I've had the happiness that Jesus gives and one is clearly better chasing Jesus. And he's here now in the water representing that he's been cleansed of his sins and he's pursuing Christ now. So Ray, who do you profess as Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. It's upon that profession I baptize you and then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome way to start. Let's continue to worship. APM service. We're so glad you guys are here worshiping with us. Y'all stand and let's sing to our God tonight. Come on, put your hands together.
a good 8 p.m. service. It's good to see you guys. My name is Erin Brady. I'm a college associate here at the way. <laughs> y'all are funny. Oh, man, it's good to see y'all. Y'all, three baptisms. Y'all, that just proves God's still in the business of changing lives. Isn't that great? Um, y'all, real quick, before we get to our testimony, I just want to announce uh, the deadline for residency applications is this Friday. So there's forms back in the, on the baptism table if you will fill those out um, tonight before you leave or just bring them to us sometime this week. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, this is, y'all, y'all know this. This is my favorite part of what we do at The Way. Um, tonight we have a really special treat. Our friend Brandon Birdsell is here um, to share his testimony. And um, I cannot wait to you guys hear how the Lord has just used him and is continuing to use him um, in his platform. Would y'all help me welcome my friend Brandon? Hey, what's up? I'm Brandon Birdsell. Um I'm a pitcher here at Texas Tech. It's my fourth year here. Um, I'm also engaged to this girl up here. Um, my story starts, you know, from a little, as a little boy, you know, I, um, my earliest memory is, I remember I was maybe five, six, and I'm sitting on the couch crying because my brothers just got baptized or baptized and saved. And uh, I'm upset because I didn't do the same thing, and my, my mom saved me right there. Um, but, you know, growing up, I didn't have uh, much of a relationship with God till I got to college. You know, um, I've, I've, I've been an athlete my whole life, and so my identity has kind of revolved around that. And so along with that, it's, you know, I, I was more of a, a bigger prospect in high school. And so, you know, that really affected the way... I treated people and how I interacted with people, and it just really defined who I was. Um, you know, I end up, I committed to uh, Texas A&M uh, my sophomore year of high school, and I thought it was my dream school, and I thought I would love every second of it. I'm sure y'all, that doesn't make y'all happy. Um, so fast forward, you know, I, I, I get selected out of high school. I chose to go to school. Um, freshman year rolls around and, and, you know, with, with the, the hype that was built around my name and I, my expectations were up here for myself, not even from everyone else. So I get there, uh, get there and first day I remember it, I'll never forget this day. Uh, we wake up and at 5.05 AM, we have to run a six minute mile. And if you know me personally, you know, running is not my favorite thing. Uh, I think my teammate can attest to that. And um, so I did not make the six-minute mile. And we had to do it eight weeks straight. And then they felt sorry for us, so they let us do time laps. And then we combined the times, and I finally passed. Um, so long story short, you know, I, I pitched seven innings at my freshman year. I don't develop very well, and uh, I end up transferring. And I thought of myself so highly just because of what I did. And I put myself so far above people because of what I did. And then at the end of it, I was the one that felt lower because I put my identity and everything I had into this one thing and it failed me. I feel like I, I lost sight of who I really was. I don't know if I've ever really known who I was outside of baseball at that point. Um, I ended up transferring to a junior college in Houston called San Jack. Um, kind of that's where my career started to turn around and I was very fortunate to have a pitching coach his name is Woody Williams I know baseball junkies he pitched in like the 2004 World Series for the Cardinals um, and he's a very strong he has a very strong faith and he helped me grow as a, as a baseball player and, and, and as a man and um, during that fall I end up I get a scholarship to come play here and so I commit here and then fall goes fine and then that winter break I went to Passion and it was phenomenal. If you ever have a chance, I highly suggest you go. I got to hear so many great people, and I heard uh, Tim Tebow speak. And he, he's one of my favorite people. He's who's, he's, he's who's changed, you know, my perspective on sports and, you know, just helped me to understand what my true identity is. Um, it's a good thing I did that because uh, my first outing of the spring, I gave up 11 runs to Wharton Junior College in less than two innings. And um, it was in that moment where I – finally understood who I was because it didn't eat me alive and it allowed me to progress forward 
Um, so COVID hits. I end up, I get a call in the third round, but I, I visited here and my heart was here. And so I, I, I said no and I came here and uh, things are going well. Oh, also, I was in a six year relationship for her. And then when it ended, when it ended, I, I thought it was the end of the world. But, you know, long story short, God's open, you, you know, he, you don't see it at the time, but God opens doors to things you never know. And I'm so grateful that all that stuff happened. Just silly, silly high school relationship. But um, so junior year happens. I start, you know, I'm playing pretty well, and then I get hurt. You know, there's, you know, rumors, first, second, third round, whatever. Um, and then I get hurt, and then I just feel like I lost myself. I feel like I got so trapped in this identity as a baseball player all over again. And... It was very hard at first, but very fortunate for, for Emily and my family and the support I had. You know, um, we were able to push past it and, you know, get back to who we really were. Um, and, you know, I still struggle with the with identity and who I really am from time to time. You know, people put us, especially athletes, on this such a high standard and like such a in a higher place in society. And it's so easy to get grounded in that and think so much highly of yourself. But you know, with God, you know, good grace of God, you know, he grounds you and helps you understand who you really are. Um, and you know, it's so, it's, I, I just want to say, you know, whatever it is that you do in life, never let it identify you, regardless. When you have success, everyone's going to want to congratulate you. But when you're in your darkest pits, there ain't going to be many people there. But when, if you let it define who you are as a person, then that's when the tough times get tough. But if you understand who you do it for that allows you to get past those moments of sadness and you know whatever it is that you struggle with um i'm so grateful for this platform and everything that god has given me and it's so easy to say i've done it for myself but i never i i haven't it's not because of me it's for the kingdom of god and it's furthering his kingdom i get emotional talking about it and you know, at the end of the day, I understand it's not about me, and it will never be about me. Um, Corbin Young, he's actually here, he's at FCA, and he said one thing, and it forever remains true to me. You know, I, you have to die to yourself and your selfish desires to live for God each and every day. It's a struggle we'll continue to go through for as long as we live, but I'll forever remember that. I recently changed my walkout song to a song called Every Victory is Yours by The Belonging Co. and uh, Danny Goki. And it says, you know, it says, every victory is yours, every victory is yours, he reigns. And I will never forget that, and I will always be who I am. Thank you. What a powerful testimony. Thank you so much for sharing, Brandon. Y'all stand and let's continue to worship tonight. The cross upon your shoulders
faith God Lord in the scriptures we see somebody come to you you say just have faith just believe and Lord they respond to you saying Lord I believe but help my unbelief Lord there's some of us in this room that are struggling with that now Jesus Lord we have the faith we know the scriptures God we know the truth but yet there's something we're holding on to. And I pray, Lord, tonight, help us to let that go. Lord, help us to look to you, the author, the perfecter of our faith, the only one who's worthy of our worship and the way we live our lives, God. We devote it to you. We pray that you would speak through Tyler now as he comes. In your name, amen. APM service, how we doing tonight? We doing good? I love y'all, y'all are my people. Don't tell the 6 p.m. service, okay? Hey man, I am so excited. My name is Tyler Heidelberg. If I have not met you, I would love to meet you tonight. I'm the college associate pastor here at The Way. And we are stepping into the final installment of How Do I Change Part Two tonight. So I hope you're ready for what God's gonna do. Would you bow your heads and pray that God would speak to you tonight from his word this evening. But not only would you pray for yourself, would you pray for me, that God would speak through me. Nothing that I have to say tonight is of any importance for our lives, but everything that God has to say through me tonight is of utmost importance for our lives, so pray that he would speak. God, we're so grateful for who you are. God, as we look to your scriptures tonight, God, I pray that we would be so encouraged to walk out of these doors changed by you. God, that we would be challenged to train up in godly, godliness tonight as your word says. God, would you help us to do it and to trust you in the process? It's in your name we pray, amen. Well, do you remember being a little kid and being asked the question, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Remember being asked that? I'll tell you what, your parents definitely remember asking you that because they wrote down all your answers every year and put them in a little scrapbook, you know what I'm talking about? 
And uh, so here's the thing. My mom's a kindergarten teacher, and, uh, and so we get some funny answers every single year. She always texts the family group text and blows it up with all the things that all her kids are responding to. But you have a couple categories, right? You have the kids who respond with all the normal things that you think they're going to respond with, right? Like, okay, another firefighter. We get it. You're a hero. Police officer. Okay, that's great. Cool. You want to be in the you know, NFL, NBA, MLB someday. You, know, you want to be an athlete. Maybe you want to be a doctor, a teacher, right? So you have that category. And then you have all of the categories that are like, I call the unicorn category, because some of them literally answer, I want to be a unicorn when I grow up. So when I first moved out here to Lubbock, y'all know, it's no secret, I hang out with the Baileys all the time, and every single message, I feel like I'm like, I'm the Uncle T, I'm Funkle Tyler to Bridget and Cassie. I say that every message. It's true. So I asked Cassie when I moved out here that question, and we have a video of it. I think. When you grow up, what do you want to be? Um, a triceratops. A what? A what? A triceratops. A salad? No. <laughs> okay, her face was so close to the, uh, the phone, I couldn't hear what she was saying. I thought she said a salad. I was like, you want to be a salad you want to grow up? At least throw some meat in there or something. Uh, but she said a triceratops is what she wanted to be when she grows up. I'm like... Girl, I don't know what they're teaching you in the Bailey household. I don't know what's going on, but that's going to be tough to accomplish, but good for you. Uh, so I was in the category of I wanted to be professional athlete when I grew up, and clearly I accomplished that. Um, but like I said, last message I preached, right, some of us, our careers, they ended at high school. Like anybody want to be, like I said, NBA, MLB, NFL, that was you, track star, swimming star, I don't know, just professional athlete. And so... Brandon Birdsell and maybe a couple of the tech players in the room tonight, maybe that's going to be true for them, but for the rest of us, you know, we peaked in high school, good for us. <laughs> but here's the thing, I never, I never for one second when I got asked that question as a kid, I never thought, what, what do I need to practically do to make myself become an NBA player in the future? Like, what do I need to accomplish to get there? Like, what are the things I need to set in place if I want to arrive at that goal, at that destination, at that career, what I want to be when I grow up, right? I wasn't thinking that at all. I was just thinking about, you know, I like playing basketball, so that's what I want to do. And so tonight, the challenge for us, kind of closing out this series as we've talked through how do I change, I want to encourage you because I think everybody in this room would say, man, I, I, I do desire to know God more. And, and I desire for my life to look more godly and to look more like Jesus. Like, that's why I'm here. That's why the notebook's open or the notes app's open on my phone, because I want to grow in godliness. And so my challenge for us tonight is to talk through the things, a couple of the things that Paul is going to give us in this passage of how do I practically get there? Like, what do I need to do if I'm actually going to train myself up in godliness? And so this is why this is important. Because what I'm talking about tonight, it doesn't change how God views you. Don't miss this. Like what I'm talking about tonight is not changing God's view of you or how close he is to you. This isn't, this isn't just another line item for you to accomplish, but it might just change how close you feel to God. And so my challenge for us tonight is that we would grow closer to God and, and see some things from the text of scripture as we train ourselves in godliness through our lives. And so he starts in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. If you have a Bible, turn there. If not, it'll be up on the screen. And Paul is writing to Timothy here. And basically, if you don't know who Paul is, Paul is just a guy whose life has been radically changed by Jesus. That's who Paul is. And so he's writing this to Timothy, a young believer in the faith, like many of us in the room tonight. And he says this in verse 1. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. And I just want to stop right there because that's interesting, right? Like he says that in later times some people, they're actually going to fall away from the faith. And I'm thinking, man, that is very, very relevant. Like how many of us, we went off to college and we're, we're out in college and we're doing some things that we're like, man, I kind of feel like I lost myself in college. Like I kind of feel like I kind of lost my faith. I kind of lost my way. And so, and so he's saying something here that's probably true. Maybe even you felt that. Like I grew up in the church or like I went to church every Sunday. Like my parents, you know, they knew God. And, 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 and then they go to, go to college and there's this like falling away. And we kind of feel that tension, I think, a lot of us. 
And so it's like this, man. I don't know if you know this girl. Maybe you are this girl, but it's like literally like a few years ago in high school, you're like, you came out of vacation Bible school. You're going to church camp and you're singing the song at church camp. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Two years later, you're in college. You're at the club. To the window, to the wall. And you're like, I'm like, how did we get here? Like, what changed? You were just a cute little girl in Sunday school. And now what? You're twerking at the club. What's going on? And, and I think for all of us, there's that realization, right, sometimes in our life, we're kind of like, how did I end up here? Like, how did I get here? I, uh, I used to go to church, and I'm at the club, and somehow my life turned into keg stands and, and frat parties and, and, and sleeping with people I don't even know their name, and you're like, how did I get here, man? And so I think it's just so important for us to listen in as we dive into this. And so he continues... And he says, some will depart from the faith. And then he says this, by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And then after that, he says, he says, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So can we get verse two up on the screen? He, uh, or verse one, excuse me. He says, Deceit, deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And then the next verse that we read, can we get up there? I'm like, what are these things? Like, this is gonna be wild, right? He's gonna list some crazy stuff. And then he says, the next verse, verse, uh, verse three, please. He literally says, people who forbid marriage and are telling you to be a vegan. That's what he's like, what? <laughs> Require abstinence from foods and forbid marriage. I thought he was about to listen to some teachings of demons is somebody saying, don't get married, don't eat meat. Like what? <laughs> and I, I'm like, that's wild. And this is why that's important. Here's the connection. Here's why Paul is saying this. Because culturally at the time, there's Christians that are, that are making this so legalistic. They're making faith about this to-do list and this to-don't list, right? And so Paul is saying this, hey, hey, the people that are leading you astray, the, the, the reason some people are actually departing for the faith is because they're weary that God is just a to-do list and a to-don't list. And so hear me start by saying that tonight, that God is not just a to-do list or a to-don't list, just another thing to add on the line item. Like a lot of us, like, like some of us, we've made relationship with God. We've made it a list of things to do. And God is saying, I want to link up with you. I, I want to know you. I want relationship with you. And he continues in verse four and says this, for everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. He says, everything created by God is good. And part of the reason there's so many people who genuinely aren't interested in God is because they genuinely believe that he isn't good. And so many people believe this about God, right? That he's not the source of enjoyment or pleasure or purpose or fulfillment. So they don't want to spend their life growing in godliness or training for anything. Like, but he says here specifically, everything created by God is good. He's the author of purpose and joy and fulfillment and the things that are good. And so the starting point for us in this passage is getting to a point where we could actually trust that and believe that. He goes on in verse six, he says to Timothy, he says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. And so my first point for us tonight is this, is that training begins by trusting. Tr training begins by trusting. So why do I start there? Because in order for you to actually be, actually be convinced of training yourself in godliness, you have to first be convinced that the truth of God's word is trustworthy. And so, and so like, we're, we're just going to have these things in our life, right? We're going to have these desires that are in disagreement with what God's directions tell us in his word. Did, did you hear that? We're going to have these desires that stand in opposition, that stand in disagreement to God's directions. And so, the, like, this is the reality. Like, I just want to step into y'all's seat right now. 
So you don't think I'm just some guy up here giving you these directions from God. Like, I've wrestled with this. I remember being in college. I graduated. I had been in a four-year relationship with a girl that I thought I was going to uh, move into spending the rest of my life with. And I remember thinking, God, like, I don't understand. Like, I did everything right. Like, I led well. Like, we went to church together. We read the Bible together. Like, I I protected our purity. We didn't cross boundaries. And I started doubting the goodness of God and whether or not his word was trustworthy for me. And I remember having a conversation with somebody, somebody in my, in my group, and this is why your friends are so important, and they said to me, hey, Tyler, hey, like, you're, you're really doubting God right now? What if you took a moment and you doubted your doubts? I was like, I never heard that before. He said, what if, what if you take the same amount of intensity that you're doubting God with and you doubt those doubts with? And that hit me in a new way. And this is the question that we're wrestling with. Do do I actually trust that God and his will and his ways and his word is the best way for me to live? That is your starting point for change once you've given your life to Jesus. And, And the tension here is between my will and my ways and my wants and, and God's, right? And, and this is how we start in life. Like, this is just a natural thing. Like, my mom is like, don't put your hand on the stove. And I'm like, ha, 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 I'm putting my hand on the stove, right? I just want to do it. And she's like, don't put your finger in the light socket. I'm like, I'm doing that. Don't ride your bike in the street because you may get hit by a car. Let me prove to you that I can ride my bike in the street without getting hit by a car. Like, there's just something in us. And as we get older, it just evolves, right? It's like, okay, God, like, really, really save sex for marriage? I don't know. And our whole life is just this questioning of authority over and over and over again. And I want to pose to you this. What if God wasn't keeping you from pleasure, but he was actually protecting you from pain? Like the reason my mom has these things that she's saying to me, it's not, once again, it's not the to don't list, right? Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. The reason she's saying those things to me is because she actually loves loves me and she doesn't want to see me get hurt. And so the motive of what she's saying isn't a thing to check off a list. All right, make sure you don't ride your bike in the street. She's saying it because she loves me and God gives us his word in these things from his word, not as a checklist, but because he cares for us. And so why do I need God's word as my compass? Proverbs 14, 12 says... There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. See, the biggest lie you could believe about God tonight is this, is that he doesn't actually have your best interest in mind. He cares about you. He cares about your life, the direction it's going. And so some of us, we spend college playing this game of like, what is the next most convenient truth? Like, what's the most convenient truth right now for the decision? It's Friday night, Saturday night, I'm here, this is where I'm at, this is the people I'm with. Like, what's the next most convenient truth for me? Rather than what is actually true. And so, so where does your truth come from? Like, who gets to define truth in your life? Is it, is it a professor? Is it, is it a boyfriend, a girlfriend, your parents? Is it a teacher? Is it your feelings? Is it your heart? Is it you? I'm just saying, (laughs) I'm not trying to diss anybody, but some of y'all, y'all change your major like five times. You really want to be the source of truth in your life? Like, hey, I'm right there with you. I can't decide what I want for dinner any night of the week. It's like, what's for dinner tonight? My roommates are like, what's for dinner? I'm like, I can't pick. I can't do it. Man, we cannot be the source of truth for the universe for what is right and wrong. So I love what it says in the NIV in verse six. It says this about being trained in the words of faith. In in verse six in, in the NIV, it says, be nourished on the truths of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. See, nourishment, I love that word. The word of God is the diet of your faith if you're a believer. Like that's what you are called to consume. And what you eat matters, right? We know this. Like how many of you guys are big sweet tooth? Like, I'm candy, dessert, all about it. I'm gonna be having cavities every year for the rest of my life, and I'm committed to it, come on. And so, like, I just love candy. Like, Kit Kats, anybody a Kit Kat fan? Big Kit Kat guy. Yeah, okay, so sour punch straws. Do y'all know what those are? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, did y'all take those and, like, drink the Coke with those? 
Oh my, that is next level. Okay, Twinkies, anybody know what, Twinkies? Yeah, yeah, one guy, we're like, boo, that's not, I don't even know if y'all would know what those are. But here's the thing, when I come to you and tell you, Kit Kats, Sour Punch Straws, Twinkies, they're nutritionally terrible for you. Nobody's like, I'm gonna disagree with you. There's a lot of healthy content in those. Nope, no one's disagreeing with me, they all agree, right? Here, okay, track with me with this. Okay, so smoking. Literally in the 1980s, they had advertisements telling all y'all's parents, smoking is good, you should do it, it's a health benefit, do it regularly. Real advertisements, paid advertisements. Guys, you could get in an airplane, a cylinder 30,000 feet in the air with thousands of gallons of jet fuel directly underneath you. Just light that puppy up, dude, the whole cabin is smoking. What's going, how did this get approved? Who, who okayed that, right? And, and here's the thing, is that now culture has shifted and says, uh, smoking's bad for you. <laughs> they were so confident that, 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 hey, this is good for you, do it, this is a regular thing. In fact, they put a label on the box, it's the surgeon's general warning, and it says this, smoking causes cancer, heart disease, emphysema, may complicate pregnancy, probably does. I'm not excited about reading that box, right? And so, so here's why I'm saying all of this. Because regardless of what you believe or what culture says about candy or smoking or anything, the fact of the matter is what? Those things are unhealthy for you. They're not good for you. If all I eat is candy and smoke, I'm just not going a good direction in life in general, guys. <laughs> but health-wise, I'm going a terrible place. And, 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 and the reason that I say that, guys, is, is because for, for us, like we can't always let facts, or we can't always let feelings determine what is fact. Right, you've heard that said, that facts don't care about your feelings, and this is, this is my challenge from this. What if faith doesn't always require feelings to follow? What if you could ask God, hey God, my cravings are for these things that I know are not good for me, but what if you could ask God, hey God, will you help me change my cravings? Because if all I eat spiritually is candy and spiritually smoke, I'm not gonna be in a good place. If all I consume is the junk the world says is truth, no wonder my relationship with the Lord is unhealthy. And so you might be sitting here asking, why does it always feel like I'm starving spiritually? Why, why does God feel so distant? Why am I not seeing growth? Why can't I change? And, and maybe it's because the only time you eat the word of God is once a week here at the way. And listen, I'm not saying that, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. But you talk to any nutritionist, right? Their plan for healthy eating is three meals a day, seven days a week. Not 21 meals on one day a week, right? And if you're trying to exist spiritually off the nutrition you get from one meal a week, no wonder you feel so distant from God. No wonder you're starving spiritually. And I remember when somebody in college said that to me. And it changed how I got in the word of God. And so do you trust that God can fill you up and will sustain you and is the source of your nutrition and can give you life? See, now that, that we're at a place where we could say, okay, I believe that God's word is trustworthy. Now I can train myself in truth. And so my second point for us tonight is this, is that you would train yourself in truth. That you would train yourself in truth. In verse 7, he says, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Train yourself in truth. So he says that there's these like silly lies that the world has that stand in opposition to God's truth. And he says, have nothing to do with them. So what are those silly irreverent myths of today, right? If it feels good, do it. Right? Follow your heart. You do you. Boo. <laughs> Yes, queen, what? What are we talking about, guys? What are we doing? Or, or, or maybe you've heard, you know, like the world says this, the world says, it says, have sex whenever you're ready. To which all the guys in the room said, I've been ready since the sixth grade. What are you talking about? What do you mean? That's terrible advice. The, the, the world says that money will make you happy or that graduating and getting a job will make you happy or a new major will make you happy. That's just adding a few thousand dollars to your degree. Um, 
or a new, re- a new relationship will make you happy. I know tons of people in relationships that are not happy. And so don't let the popular opinion of the day determine for you what is true. Be nourished in the truth of God's word instead of the myths and silly things that the world has to offer. And here's here's how you can do that best. You are most capable of recognizing what is false when you know what is true. Don't miss that. You're most capable of recognizing what, what is false that the world is giving you when you actually know what the truth is. That's why it's so important for you to get in the word of God. So do any of you guys use cash? Do y'all know what that is? Cool. So there's this thing called a $100 bill, if you've ever heard of it. And uh, if you pay with a $100 bill, those of you who are lucky enough to use those dollars, um, when you pay with a $100 bill, what happens is you hand it to the person and they have to like check it, right? They like pick it up, they put it in the light, they pull out a magic marker out of nowhere and they like swipe on it. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Let's go, y'all. Okay, I'm not too old. (laughs) And so they swipe on this thing. They're like checking it to see if it's real, right? And so they swipe on it. And then they like, you know, divvy up, give you your change and hand it to me. And I just want to take a magic marker out of my back pocket and check the change they just gave me. Why should I trust you, buddy, if you don't trust me? (laughs) And so so here's what happens when they're trained, though. They're they're trained to know what a real $100 bill looks like. They don't spend all this time, all right, let's teach everybody all the fake things that are going to happen. No, they study what is true. So when a fake one shows up, they know that it's fake because they've looked at the real thing. They've looked at what is true. And so the fake, it can't fool them because they know, oh, that's not what the real one looks like. And this is what God says for us. How you're going to spot the fake truths of the world, the lies, the temptations, the hey, run after this, hey, pursue this, is you know what the truth of God's word says. I remember uh, being in college and uh, just having this realization as I was wrestling uh, just with what God wanted me to do with my life and changing my major and ended up going into ministry and stuff. And I remember spending a lot of time meeting with Travis and we would get in the word of God. And we, we did this thing where we watched this thing. It was called the elephant room. And basically it was just like two guys arguing different points of scripture on a passage. And I was like, this is so exciting. I like got super into it. And I just remembered the Bible and the word of God and the truth of God's word just coming alive to me. And it just impacting my walk. And I want that for you. And so when things come your way that are there's just lies of the world, you can speak truth into it. And so Paul continues in the second half of that verse. He says, have nothing to do with the reverent silly myths. And then he says, but rather train yourself for godliness. Like this is the Greek word gymnazo. Can anybody guess what that means? Gym, gymnasium, look at you. You guys are in seminary. Way to go, scholars. And so, and so this word literally means to train, and, and, and what's valuable about that is, and, and let me just say, first of all, like, the, the challenge that I'm giving to you guys, this is somebody who surrendered their life to Jesus, Be, because if you don't have a gym membership, it doesn't, you can't get in to train, and so you have a gym membership, you get in, you're, you're training, and so what happens is, is just because I go to the gym, though, that doesn't mean that I'm going to get fit, right? Like, I have to pick up the work. Like the, the, I don't even know what they're called. That's how much I work out. Dumbbells, guys, come on, it's a workout. You gotta pick up the dumbbells. You gotta actually pick up. And, and let me say, it is a great start. Listen, me getting to the gym, that is a great start for me to train, okay? So, so, so in the same way, spiritually, just because you come to the church, right, that's not gonna grow you in your godliness. You have to choose to step into doing that and reading the word of God. But coming here is a great start to doing that. But he challenges us. To grow, And he says in verse 8, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. He says that godliness goes with you. It's valuable for now and it's valuable for the life to come. And some of you, you spend more time trying to, to look good than you do trying to look godly. Like, let's just be honest. And he's saying godliness is what matters forever. Girl, you get that Planet Fitness membership. You go to Nick's Fight Club, you do what you're going to do, but you ain't taking any physical gains into heaven. You're taking spiritual gains with you. So are you working on your spiritual gains? He says, this saying is trustworthy in verse nine and deserving of full acceptance for to this end, we toil and we strive. Those are just, those are training words, right? There's, there's, a, there's a struggle there. There's training involved. Because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. 
Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but what? Set the believers as an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And so here's where the message gets really, really practical. That if we, uh, uh, that training begins by trusting. And as we train in truth, this is where we're going to see evidence in our life. These are the things that Paul lists right here. He says, in, you're going to set an example in your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, your purity. And so here's the practicality. By getting in the word of God, those things are going to begin to change. So, so with your speech, right, ask yourself this question. Man, how do I talk? What are the words that I use? Like before I came to Christ, like cussing, no big problem. I came to Christ, now I kind of feel cringy when I'm doing that. Like I feel like it's not right. Like something's off there. Like tearing down people with your words. Now it's like, ah, oh, no, like, like gossip is not something I should be a part of. Like I build up people with my words now. This is going to give evidence that, that, that you're following Jesus, that you're in his word. He says in conduct, so how do I act? Right? Does the way that I act, does the way that I live, does it represent Jesus to people? Are the choices that I'm making, do they represent Jesus to people? He says in love, so how do I love? Like do people know you as a hateful person or judgmental, judgy? Or are you somebody who is full of love? He says in faith, is belief in Jesus evident? Like when you go through a tough time or, or you're struggling, it's like, man, how'd you get through that? Man, I, I don't know. I just, I, I have faith in Jesus. I went through a, a difficult situation, man. I'm putting my trust in Jesus. Do you live in faith or do you live in fear? And then he says, in purity. And am I living pure? That's a check. That's a balance for us to know that we are training in godliness. Man, do, do I value purity or am I known by my pro, promiscuity? And my training in godliness. See, all of these things go back to the word of God helps me know how to live these out. And so we get to verse 15, and Paul just gives an encouragement to Timothy. He says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. Why? So that all may see your progress. He says, immerse yourself, right? Like dive deep. Get out of the kiddie pool. Get out of the shallow end. Dive deep. And, and, and why do we struggle to immerse ourselves, like in the things of God and in training and practicing these things? I think we struggle because we get discouraged by the process. And, and, and so my next point is this, is that the, the progress is actually in the process. D don't miss that. The progress is in the process. He says, practice these things. Repetition produces results. Practice. And, and don't misunderstand me. All, all of these things here, right, they're process words, training, toil, strive, practice. The whole passage says that you do these things so that you may see your progress. The goal here isn't what? The goal is not perfection. The goal is progress. And often we try and make it, well, I, I got to be perfect. I got to do this perfectly. Oh, I messed up. And so, oh, I'm done. God's not going to love me. We get discouraged in the process because we can't see what's happening beyond the surface. And, and what happens is, is that all of us, all of us, we're in the process. Like, I love to say this, like, pastors are in progress too. <laughs> pastors are people too. And literally last week, honestly, this message and, and just some other things going on in my life, we're sitting at Teddy Jack's after Easter and, and I'm having dinner with Travis and his family and stuff and, and, and Aaron and literally I have the tightest chest feeling I've ever felt in my life out of nowhere. I thought I was like having a heart attack. And I'm sitting there and like it's visibly evident. Travis and Aaron notice it. They start like talking to me, whatever. And dude, I'm, I'm having an anxiety attack for the first time in my life. And I'm, I'm like, okay, breathe, like, okay. And I'm trying to play it off. You know, we're guys, I'm like trying to play it off like it's not a big deal <laughs> because I'm trying to be tough. And I'm stressing. We went and saw the Batman movie afterwards. I'm sure that didn't help. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm like, just breathe. And, and, and here's, here's why I'm saying this. I don't have a medical issue with anxiety like, like some of you guys do. And that's a struggle and, and you work through that and there's medicine. Like this was clearly me being overwhelmed with what was happening in my life and not trusting God with it. And I, I was sitting there and I had to, and this is the process. This is what it looks like. I'm sitting there. I'm like, just breathe. And it's ironic, like on my phone, on my lock screen, I just put just breathe on there like two days before. And I was like, just breathe. 
And I quoted to myself Philippians 4, 6. That says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with thanksgiving through prayer and supplication, make your requests made known to God. And I just sat there, just breathe, and quoting that scripture to myself. And I wish I could say right away, it just went away. It took me a full like 12, 18 hours, somewhere in there. It's like when I woke up the next day before I actually felt at peace again. Like we're all in process with this. And so don't give up. I think the reason a lot of people give up is because they don't see progress fast enough in their life or in their faith, in their walk. Like this happens all the time, right? You work out three times a week. You're like, I did cardio all of those times. The goal was to lose weight, stepped on the scale. I'm two pounds heavier. Why do I even work out in the first place, you know? You read for class, actually. You're like, my grade just as awful as it was when I didn't read. Why am I reading? (laughs) You pray to God, and you're like, feel like nothing got answered. I think we wrongly conclude that these small good decisions don't matter that much, or or the opposite. We mess up once, and so we give up completely, right? I I ate an Oreo. Might as well eat the whole bag, bro. (laughs) That's my life. I failed a quiz. Might as well drop the class, you know? (laughs) But, but like spiritually, like, like, like listen, like spiritually, like we do this, right? Like God, <laughs> I looked at porn. Might as well do it the rest of the week. I, I messed up. I'll start next week. Man, I, I gave up my virginity. I might as well just not. I might as well just give that away over and over again. I might as well not protect it. <laughs> like you see what we do there? And then this one that's a little, you know, less serious. All right, well, we're in April. I said I was going to read the Bible through in a year. I stopped in, G- in Genesis in January. Like, might as well wait till next January, you know what I'm saying? And we just get discouraged because we mess up or we want to give up. And so my, my, my challenge is don't give up. Paul says continue to practice these things. Because if you want to see the result tomorrow, you're going you're gonna to stress yourself out. So it's the problem. The problem is oftentimes when we practice, we're seeking perfection rather than resting in the progress. And listen, as you are in progress, Jesus is your perfection. You're looking to be perfect when Jesus is saying, just be in progress. Like this is the gospel. It, it, it changes us. That's the start. Like in order to, for you to even think about changing and tra- training and godliness, like you have to first accept that God has sent his son Jesus so that you can be changed. And so we can rest in the process knowing Jesus is our perfection. And so my final point tonight is this, is that training has a tipping point. See, your progress and your perseverance, it's not being wasted, it's actually being stored up. And uh, my, my engineering majors, Whitaker check. Um, come on, yeah. They're gonna love this, right? So like there's three states of water, right? It exists in three different states, okay? So, <laughs> so, so in those changes, there's like degrees of temperature that matter for those changes to happen. So who knows the boiling point of water? Cool. <laughs> no one, Texas Tech education. Come on, guys, what are we doing? This, 212 degrees, 212 degrees. I should have said Fahrenheit. That's my bad, my bad. Not Celsius, Fahrenheit. So, so here's what's happening, though, is before water reaches a boiling point, um, there's a process that takes place. And so I want to look at that. So I got a picture of water. This is water at 100 degrees, okay? Now, now we have another picture. This is picture of water at 120 degrees. All right, can we get the one of water at 140? Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool, 180 how about, how about 200? Can we see it? That's good, that's good. That's good. <laughs> okay, so, so scientifically, as water is heating up, there's something that is happening. But to the visible eye, physically, there is no evidence of anything going on, right? Like you can't see what's happening behind the scenes but something's happening. And when water gets to 210, 211, there begins to be some evidence of what's going on and there's, there's some bubbling of the water, there's some stuff that's happening and you begin to see, oh, like something's been happening all along and then bam, at 212 degrees, it's boiling. 
It's boiling. And seemingly out of nowhere, the water just went from like what, 100 degrees to 212. But something was happening the entire time. And your faith, it has a tipping point. There is something that God is doing in every single one of your lives as you seek after him and you get into his word and you go to a community group and you spend time in prayer on your hands and knees in your closet and you're crying out to God. God is doing something in your life. And you have these moments where you can look back and see, man, man, I was tempted in that moment and I didn't give in. My faith, there was a tipping point. Man, somebody asked me uh, about a truth of God's word and somehow I knew that scripture and that was a tipping point. Man, somebody asked me to pray with them over their life and that was a tipping point. Man, there's these moments in your life where you can look and say, man, God was doing something all along and I had no clue. And for me, this moment happened a few weeks ago. I was sitting in, and I was, I was talking to Travis and, I was thinking about how when I was a student in high school, man, I would go to youth group every single Wednesday. I'd go to the, to the camps and the retreats and all these things, and I was sitting there taking notes, listening into the speakers, writing down. Man, I was just wanted, I was eager for God. And I had no clue that that whole time God was writing a bigger story. And, and I told Travis the other week, I was like, dude, this is crazy. Like, I, we used to be the kids sitting, taking notes, and now we're the guys who are giving the stuff that people are taking notes on. Like, how did this happen? And I remember being in college when, when Travis was helping me wrestle through a call to ministry. He gave me this Bible before he left, and I took over as youth pastor. And he wrote in the, in the front page, He said, it's been awesome knowing you as my friend. God is going to use you to do great things. As you continue to follow him and cling to the words in this book, never quit pursuing Jesus. I love you, bro, in Christ. Travis Bailey. And I study with this Bible from time to time still. And I had it on the counter the other day. And he, he opened it up and he read that. And he looked at me and said, I was right. <laughs> oh, bro. Oh, man, <laughs> that just made my life. <laughs> and listen, God is doing something in your life. And the people in the classrooms you sit in and the family that God gave you and the little siblings that are underneath you or the older siblings God gave you or the siblings you don't have or the extended family, God is giving you opportunities to as you train in your godliness to use those things to share with others. Don't miss this. He says in verse 15, so that all may see your progress. And then he ends the chapter by saying this, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. See, the goal is change, not just for your life, but so that you might help change someone else's. And as you leave here, like we have one more week at the way this semester, you're gonna leave, you're gonna go back home. Some of you, you gave your life to Christ this year. Some of you, you gave your life to Christ this semester. Some of you gave your life to Christ this month. And you're gonna go back home and there's gonna be evidence from your life that something changed. And you're gonna be around old friends and, and, and old family and old habits may begin to kind of creep back in and come at you and everything. And I just want to encourage you because you're saying, man, I don't have the way this summer. I don't have the way this summer. How am I going to stay true in my faith? You have the living word of God with you. And if you don't have a Bible, I'll give you one tonight. Just come and ask me. You have the spirit of God that lives in you. So would you spend your life training? to know him more, and if you don't know him, would you give him and surrender your life to him tonight? Would you bow with me? God, I am so grateful. 
Jesus, for your love for us. God, not that you're here to give us a list of rules and regulations and requirements, God, but you're asking things of us because you love us and you care for us. So I pray tonight that the students in this room, they would hear, man, if if they don't know Jesus, that, that God, you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross to pay for their sins so that they could have relationship with you, not rules for you, relationship with you. And if they've never surrendered that tonight, God, they would lay down their life and say, God, here's my life. I trust you. I believe Jesus is Messiah. I believe he's the Savior. I want to give my life to him. And if that's you, tonight's your night. You can believe that in your seat as you sit right now. And if you're a Christian in this room and you feel, felt that verse one, man, I've been running from God, I've departed from the faith, tonight's your night to come back and begin training again in the goodness and the godliness of the Lord who loves us. Let's worship that God now. If you guys made a decision tonight or need to talk to somebody, there's going to be people at the back of the room, but let's stand as we close in worship tonight. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal I've stolen your bed You sing my own song And Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent Shackles I wear And I bought on my own Scarlet sin At a crimson cost You nail my day To that old rugged cross An empty sleigh At the empty
leader here at The Way. I'm so glad you came out to our service tonight and I wanted to share a few important announcements with y'all. Next week will be our final service of the semester and we'll be having a night of worship you don't want to miss. Grab a friend and we'll see you there. If you're in an organization at Tech, LCU, or SPC, we would love to bring Tiff's Treats Cookies to one of your meetings at the beginning of next school year in order to invite your organization out to The Way. Please sign up in the comments after the service. If you are interested in giving your life to Christ, getting baptized, or want to know more what baptism is, you can sign up in the comments or come down front after service. Lastly, if this is your first time coming to The Way, we really want to connect with you. If you haven't already, find anyone with a leader shirt on and we'll get you a connection card to fill out. We'd love to get to know you and help you get connected. That's everything for tonight. Have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday, May 1st. All right, guys. So next week the last way of the semester, guys. So sad. Hey, you don't want to miss it. Be here next week. We'll have services at regular time, six and eight with a meal in between. And hey, I wasn't lying. If you need a Bible, I would love to give you the word of God if you don't own one, okay? Hey, myself and Travis, we're going to be down front and Aaron as well. If you would like to meet us, talk to us, need prayer, anything, come say hi. But otherwise, have a great week. We'll see you next time.